Regarding seeds, what are the most important things a person can do to preserve heirloom seeds, stop GMOs, uh, preserve our topsoil, stop the use of chemicals, and stop the overuse and misuse of water? Well, all of the problems that you have stated are linked to the seed. It's when chemical industry started to be, breed seed to have more chemical use that seeds started to need more water. And therefore water and agriculture became water intensive. My research has shown 10 times more use of water to grow the same amount of food under chemical conditions compared to organic. The second thing that happened was that monoculture seeds grown with chemicals also then invited mechanization of a large scale that started to destroy the soil. What can every ordinary person do for the seed? First remember that anything you eat begins as seed. And therefore if you're thoughtful about what you're eating, you need be, to be thoughtful about the seed. The measures and criteria of seed breeding have robbed our plants of their nutrition and fill them with toxics. And therefore, they've robbed our diets of nutrition and filled our bodies with toxics. So, A, we must start looking for food grown from what you call heirloom seeds, I call open pollinated seeds, I call seeds that are living seeds, not seeds that have been killed of their energy, either through technologies that uh, put too much toxics like the GMOs, or even the attempt of Monsanto to make the terminator seed, to make sterile seed. I mean, can you imagine seed that will give you sprouts? And if it won't give you sprouts, what kind of benefit to your body is it going to bring? So to make sure you eat food that's GMO free, free of chemicals, free of the deprivation of nutrients in the seed. And that means you must shift to heirloom seed. Now, as an eater, you need to eat food from heirloom seeds. But I think I invite everybody to say, adopt at least one seed and say, I'll take care of you. It could be a little basil in your windowsill. It could be a tulsi. It could be one tomato plant. Because with that commitment, you are not only committing yourself to the continuity of life, you're committing yourself to the abundance that that seed create. One tiny tobacco seeds will give you thousands. And you'll realize that this scaremongering of scarcity that the industrial system creates to make us dependent on buying junk food, that that is a system we can create an alternative to. And the alternative begins in a little seed. What is in soil that's so important? In soil is life. All ancient cultures, which did not have microscopes, knew there's life in the soil. And that's why in Indian culture, we have an Atharva Ved, an ancient Ved, that says, I will tell you, Mother Earth, but I promise to not wound you in trying to get my food. And I'll never take more than is absolutely necessary for those who depend on me. And even more importantly, in an old way, that 4,000 years ago it said, in this handful of soil is your future. Take care of it, it will take care of you. Destroy it, it will destroy you. The history of every civilization that has been wiped out is a history of the destruction of soil. And the fact that India has continued for 10,000 years farming in gentle ways is because we took care of the soil long before we knew microscopically what's in it. The British sent an agricultural scientist. At that time, there was no agriculture science. He was called the economic botanist, Albert Howard, to India to introduce industrial farming, commodity farming. He arrived and he says, in his book, The Agricultural Testament, arrived and saw the soils were fertile. There were no pests in the field. I decided to make the Indian peasant my professor. 
The book he wrote called The Agricultural Testament is called The Bible of Modern Organic Farming. It's been published by Rodale in America, Soil Association in England, and the modern organic farming grew from these systems. What were these systems? These were the ancient systems of taking care of the soil. But what Howard did was use his scientific training to understand why the systems that Indian peasants had used had created lasting systems and perennial systems. And as he says, farming here is as permanent as the prairie, as the forest, as the ocean. And the two laws he learned well, the law of biodiversity and the law of return. We must give back. And he focused on the trillions and trillions of soil microorganisms there are. He focused on the mycorrhizal fungi, which is the fungi that they're now finding that in a cubic inch of soil, it's eight miles of it. And it can go to a tree far away and pick up the nutrients and to bring it to a plant that is impoverished. They've done new experiments that have shut off nutrition to particular plants. And they find the soil fungi is redistributing nutrition and creating a soil food web. There's new research that's showing that the soil is a much richer communication system than the World Wide Web. They call it the soil web. There's more communication going on. And even Darwin, who's only cited in industrial society as supporting competition, which wasn't true, they distorted the reading of the survival of the species. He's written two books that to me are extremely important. Not very popular, not very read. I think every school child and every college student should be reading it. One is called The Mold. It's about the earthworm. And Darwin writes, when the history of human evolution is written, this species will get the credit for supporting humanity. Because it's the earthworm mold is what is the true fertilizer, much more efficient than all the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium we apply, much more efficient in giving us micronutrients. And the second extremely important book that he wrote was on the root of the plant, which he called the brain of the plant. And he's talking about the amazing communication going on between the root and the soil microorganisms, including the fact that those who are now fascinated with the plant-based diet, in India we knew plants can fix nitrogen and give us good protein. At the time, the West had no idea that either of these things are possible. For them, protein came from meat and nitrogen came from synthetic fertilizer. The rhizobium in the root of the leguminous plant, the nitrogen-fixing plant, is a non-violent alternative to the violent systems of creating synthetic fertilizers by blasting fossil fuels at very high temperature to then ruin the soil, kill every soil organism, ruin the water with nitrogen runoff and the dead zones, and ruin the atmosphere with nitrous oxide. Uh, we have to learn from the soil how to live together as humanity. And we've done a manifesto called Terra Viva. People can go to the website of Seed Freedom to see it. Terra Viva is about our soil, our commons, our future. And while doing it, we realized that the world for fertile soil in Latin is humus. The root of the word for humanity is humus. We are the soil.